Good things come to those who wait. And boy, have we waited for this. The Sonic Frontier's Final Horizon update is finally here. Being the final of the three content updates rolled out across all of 2023, all of which added some pretty cool new features, the Final Horizon delivers the biggest one of all by a long shot. I gotta say, I was truly stunned by the amount of content in this update. Yes, it promised new playable characters, an alternate ending to the game, new challenges, and even hinted at a new super form for our beloved Blue Rat. But that still didn't prepare me for the whopping 9 hours I spent just to roll credits. And the additional couple hours I spent going back to replay the new cyberspace levels and complete more of the map. That's almost the entirety of the time it took me to beat the entire base game back when it came out, and I still have even more to do until I 100% it. The Final Horizon isn't a simple post-launch content update with a couple added features like the updates to come before it. It's a massive rehaul of the entire ending segment of Sonic Frontiers. And like most everything Sonic, it has fans divisive on whether they like it or not. So where do I stand on all of this? Well, join me today as we explore the final content update of Sonic Frontiers. Welcome to Chow Mix, and this is The Final Horizon. <laughs> Base Sonic Frontiers has been one of my favorite Sonic games to come out in a long, long time. But for a lot of people, myself included, it left a sour taste in their mouths when it came to the ending of the game. Even in my own review of the base game, I thought the ending was lacking in pretty much all aspects. The final island was a bit too similar to the first, the game had this amazing build-up to what ended up being essentially a big nothing sandwich, the story felt half-finished, and the final boss was a glorified version of the hacking minigame. With so many missed opportunities, I couldn't help but feel a bit disappointed. Sure, it didn't take away from what I enjoyed up until that point, but it definitely left me feeling empty inside. Like we could have had something truly amazing and were robbed and left with something that was almost amazing. If only it didn't have to turn out that way. I mean, it's not like like they could just redo the ending, right? Huh, so I'm reading the video game rulebook now and there technically isn't any rule that says you can't do that, so... And that is basically what Sonic Team did with Update 3. The Final Horizon basically gives us an alternate ending portion of the game. When reaching Oranos Island, the final island of the game, you have the choice of either continuing as usual to get the regular ending of the game, or walking through this giant ring to commence another story. The premise of The Final Horizon is simple. You may remember back on Rhea Island, Sonic becomes trapped in between the real world and the cyber dimension due to the corruption he collected from saving his friends. So Sonic's friends, who had just been saved, sacrificed their physical forms to bring him back into reality and suppress his corruption. Like I said in my review, I was not a fan of how this chain of events played out. There was a lot of build-up to some kind of new form playing into the cyber corruption plotline. So Sonic's friends basically erasing all of the hard work that he put into saving them, and also killing the dream of a new form in one foul swoop really rubbed me the wrong way. But now, once Sonic arrives to Uranos, Sage presents him a new game plan, and... It's kind of hilarious. Basically, Sage proposes to reverse everything I just explained. So Sonic's friends throwing away all of our progress in saving them and magically healing Sonic's cyber corruption? It's as if it never happened. Listen, if you're telling me that you can reverse my least favorite part of the story, I'm all for it. However, because this would unsuppress Sonic's cyber corruption, Sage would have to suppress the corruption herself so that Sonic doesn't, you know, die. All of this would make it so that Amy, Knuckles, and Tails can go out and retrieve the Chaos Emeralds for him. And in the meantime, Sonic would learn how to control his his cyber corruption and convert it into power. Yeah, this is looking to be literally everything that I wanted out of Sonic Frontiers' ending originally. Very promising so far, but does Update 3 actually fix any of the problems in the base game's ending? Does it make the final island any better? Does it have a less anticlimactic conclusion? Well, let's start off with the biggest addition to Update 3, the additional playable characters, Amy, Knuckles, and Tails. The last time we've truly been able to play as Sonic's friend in a mainline 3D Sonic game was back when MySpace was the king of social media. Back when flip phones were the peak of technology. Not to sound like a total boomer, but yes, it's been that long. And for those of you who are too young to even know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about 2006. Yes, all the way back in Sonic 06. Sonic 06 did a lot wrong, but the existence of multiple playable characters was never one of them. It sucks that it took Sonic Team this long to realize this, but better late than never, right? The gameplay loop for each character is simple. After finding out that the Chaos Emeralds aren't in their usual vaults since the Coco had moved them to more secure locations, each character traverses Oranos Island solving various puzzles and platforming challenges to find them, all of which are leagues harder than anything from the base game. But we'll get into this later. Each character has their own fortes, obviously 
obviously, and have different platforming challenges and puzzles that are suited towards them. You can easily tell whose is whose by which color the obstacle course is. Pink for Amy, red for Knuckles, and yellow for Tails, naturally. We love our color coordination. Completing these rewards you with new types of cocoa, like map cocoa to fill out your map, or skill piece cocoa to give you skill points. Because yes, every character has their own skill tree, and it's pretty awesome. You start out with only the bare minimum, so no fancy moves or attacks right off the bat. Yes, that means Knuckles needs to learn how to punch. But after unlocking a few of these abilities, each character's unique moveset really starts to take form. The vision becomes clear. Let's begin with Amy, since she's the first character we start out playing as. Amy has a lot of tarot cards. It's like every little thing she does involves tarot cards in some way. Because Sonic Team loves to do the thing where they overcorrect by taking something they were slightly lacking in and dialing it up to 11 to make up for it. In this case, making up for Amy's tarot cards being something mentioned like one time in the manual of Sonic CD or something and then being completely forgotten about. Because these things have been goddamn everywhere lately, like in IDW, Sonic Origins, and now Frontiers. It's a minor nitpick, but all in all, I'm actually a huge fan of Amy's moveset, tarot cards included. Her card float gives insane height and lets her glide, which is super useful for platforming for obvious reasons. And this isn't a double jump, it's a triple jump, meaning she has two full jumps she can do before on top of this insanely powerful jump. She also has a stomp that bounces her way up high if held down and allows you to glide. Plus, you can still use your double jump and your card float after this for even more insane height. You can even chain these together and it makes platforming feel effortless. For some more combat-oriented moves, Amy has her card attack, which can combo into her card spin. All pretty self-explanatory, but if you spin for too long, Amy gets dizzy unless you have the upgrade for it that lets you do it indefinitely. Multi-lock is another useful move, which is like a Sonic Lost World-style homing attack that allows you to zip through obstacles even like these lasers. Out of everyone, Amy probably plays the most like Sonic. In fact, I think she might even play better than Sonic. Her one downside is that she isn't able to climb walls. It really threw me off guard the first time I flung myself at the wall and I didn't stick. After reaching the first Chaos Emerald, we shift focus to Knuckles. Wall climbing and gliding is what this guy is known for, and yes, you can do that here. However, you're only able to climb very specific walls. Pretty much any of the teal walls you'd be able to wall run as Sonic, and then these specialized red walls built specifically for Knuckles. And it makes sense, being able to wall climb literally everything would completely break the game and kind of defeat the purpose of any platforming challenge. Wouldn't want that to happen now, would we? <laughs> Knuckles also has the Drill Stomp, which is similar to the Drill Dive from Sonic Adventure 2, where he darts straight down in a furious spiral and slams down with an explosive impact. For his combat-oriented moves, he has a fiery three-hit combo series of punches and the Drill Spin Attack, which shoots Knuckles into an enemy, attacking them a certain amount of times depending on how long you held the button down. Since Knuckles has a lot of horizontal mobility due to his glide, along with the fact he can scale up certain walls, the verticality of his jumps compared to Amy and Tails would have to be his biggest weak point. While the other characters have some sort of third jump to shoot them upwards, Knuckles has to rely on finding climbable walls in order to gain this vertical height. After reaching the second Chaos Emerald, we once again shift focus, this time to Tails. It's been so long since we've been able to play as this guy. Yeah, this is true for all of these characters, but the difference with Tails is that he was forced to be on the sidelines to simply watch Sonic do things in every game. I mean, this guy is Sonic's best pal, his right-hand man. He's supposed to be out there with him right there with him, at his side, during his adventures, but he never was. He would just watch, hiding behind his little iPad. Well, I can happily say they grounded him from the iPad for Update 3. Tails is back, baby. Tails naturally is able to fly, and similar to Amy, this is on top of having a single and double jump. And even then, his flight has two phases to it. The first, where Tails hangs for a second at the same height it was activated. Tails pointed towards the ground. This allows you to use his flight for just a second in order to get a little bit more horizontal distance without having to fly all the way up. It's pretty useful in very specific situations. And then a second phase where Tails boosts himself up to an extended height, this time flying upright. But by far, Tails has the best vertical mobility out of anyone in the game, and it feels damn good to play around with. Tails also has a stomp in the form of mounting a giant drill and slamming down into the ground. It's a bit flashy compared to what everyone else has, but I'm glad Tails gets to show off for a bit, he kinda deserves it. For his attacks, instead of throwing dummy rings or tail swiping, he throws goddamn wrenches. He just has a bottomless bucket of these things because he can throw these bad boys all day. 
His wrenches actually have really good lock-on properties, so you can totally snipe obstacles while airborne. And it's pretty satisfying to spam them because you can throw these suckers fast. If you hold down the attack button, Tails throws several wrenches that spin around in unison and hover forward for a short time. It's all cool stuff. Tails' biggest weakness has to be the fact that he isn't able to perform the homing attack like every other character. But I mean, think about it. He's able to hover in place and has the best vertical mobility from a mere jump in the game. Yeah, it can be annoying that you aren't able to home in on a target, but you have more than enough time to steer him in the air to whatever you're trying to land on. Now, there's a few more abilities each character has that I haven't talked about yet, and the reason is, is that they're all abilities they have in common. You know, besides just basic jumping and boosting. So I wanted to talk about them all together now that we've got all of their unique abilities out of the way. The first is the Psy Loop, which functions exactly as Sonic's does. It's obviously used for a bunch of the puzzles in Oranos Island, just like you'd expect. But each character also has a quick side loop, which is able to be performed with a single button press as long as you have enough charge meter for it. And you're gonna need this one, because there's a handful of puzzles that revolve around it. Every character also has the Spin Dash, the very same one that was introduced in Update 2. Now, to be honest, I never actually unlocked the Spin Dash until now. I didn't exactly play Update 2 enough to get it, so this was actually my first time really playing around with it. So let me give you my mini review. This thing is awesome. It's like a mix between between the boost and Sonic Lost World's continuous spin dash, and you're able to get some crazy air by launching yourself off of slopes like in the Sonic Adventure games. This is the way to traverse. It's way faster than the boost and doesn't hyper-magnetize you to the ground, which is the biggest reason you're able to launch yourself into the stratosphere. While it might not be a traditional spin dash, it's still an amazing movement tool that opens up the game in so many new ways. For all three characters, this was the first big move I saved up for and made sure to get as early as possible. Anyways, each character also has what I refer to as an ultimate move because these moves require you to have the maximum amount of rings to perform. For Amy, she's able to use the card spin boost, which lets her drift around in a wheel of cards at mock speed and even damage enemies. This move is absolutely hilarious, but also super cool, even if it's a bit hard to control. Knuckles has his Drill Spin Boost, which is essentially the boost, but with offensive capabilities. And then we have Tails, who by far has the most busted ultimate move in the entire game. It is hands down one of the most broken moves in all of Sonic. Tails can enter the Cyclone, and literally just fly around everywhere. It costs boost meter to use, but if you draw an infinity symbol with the Psy Loop to get infinite boost, it straight up just lasts forever. This completely breaks Tails' platforming challenges. Like, what's the point in doing any of this when you can just fly straight to the destination? I literally felt so bad for using this on one of the difficult platforming challenges one time that I willingly decided to go back to try doing it the legit way because I wanted to make sure I was actually reviewing the game. But man, it is fun to just go wherever the heck you want. Like, actually just wherever the hell you want. I'm so glad this thing is back too, by the way. The Cyclone first appeared in Sonic Adventure 2 and was Tails' main method of transportation. After that, we never really saw it again in any meaningful way. So this right here is some good fan service that I will gladly eat up. Anyways, one more thing I noticed about each character's skill tree is that the abilities seem to be more movement focused rather than combat focused. Each character only has about two attacks and the rest are completely movement based abilities that either let you do some kind of crazy jump or roll around in slightly different ways. Compare this to Sonic's skill tree, which are almost all attacks that do pretty much the same thing with slightly different animations, and you'll realize how small Sonic's moveset really is. It was actually a big issue I had with the base game. Movement options were something I felt the base game was severely lacking in. Yeah, adding the spin dash was a huge improvement, but I always felt like they could have done more. After all, Sonic has a lot of abilities. I made a whole huge ass video talking about all of them. So giving our friend characters their own cool and unique movement options definitely helps vary the gameplay. They very easily could have just given these characters a copy paste of Sonic's entire moveset. Just slap these new character models over Sonic basically, but they didn't. For once I can finally say, we made it to the good timeline. The only issue is that the lack of combat options is pretty noticeable when you uh, go into combat, especially against the Guardians. Admittedly, this is probably the area of the DLC I explore the least. I actually have yet to defeat one of these upgraded guardians besides Ghost, but in the attempts that I had, I felt like these characters really had a hard time dealing with these enemies. Like they didn't have enough combat options to efficiently take care of them. But then again, I barely played around with it, so I can't really judge. I guess now that we're talking about issues, I think it's time we talked about some of the big negatives for each character that really stuck out to me. Nothing is perfect, and that applies to all three of our new playable characters as well. There were a few things that bugged me during my playthrough with each of them. A lot of it comes down to the frame data of certain abilities. What I mean by this is that there are certain abilities with huge startup times, like Knuckles' Drill Stomp or Tails' Spike Stomp. 
Every time you want to do a simple stomp with any of these two characters, which is something that comes out instantly for Sonic and Amy, you need to wait out like a two second animation before it even begins. Or every time you want to glide as Knuckles, you have to do this entire backflip in place which takes what feels like a second or two. This might not seem like too bad of an issue at first, but during these animations, you're completely stuck in place for an uncomfortable amount of time. And it really messes with the flow state of the game when you're constantly getting interrupted by these annoying startup animations. It just makes precise platforming more difficult than it has to be when the move isn't as instant as it should be. But the worst offenders of this flaw are probably the startup animations for Amy's card spin boost and Tails' cyclone boost, both of their ultimate moves. Yeah, these are cool moves, but they override your regular boost whenever you have max rings. Meaning, if you're at max rings and just want to do a simple boost, which is honestly a pretty common occurrence, for instance, let's say you're jumping to a platform and need that tiny extra oomph to make it across, you now have to hold the boost button down and wait for this entire animation to play out before it sends you flying at mock speed. Not only is it more annoying, but it's also much harder to control due to the added anticipation. There really isn't a convenient way either to just lose rings in order to disable these. You have to go really out of your way to find something to get hurt by, and even then you'll probably be picking up more rings along the way that'll just bring you back up to max rings again. It's not a very intuitive way of using these abilities. I know there are only so many buttons on a controller, but I really think these ultimate abilities should have been mapped to something other than the boost button. Another thing that annoyed me was how finicky attaching to a wall with Knuckles was. There were times that I'd fall into a wall and he just wouldn't grab on, and I think it had to do with whether you're holding down the jump button or not at the time of making contact with the wall. It's kind of hard to explain, but if you played the update, you've probably come across a few instances where this has happened. It's something you just feel and know something is off. Like, huh, I should have grabbed the wall here, but I didn't. Speaking of Knuckles, his glide turning speed is hilariously slow. I had a few times where I needed to make some tight air maneuvers and I just could not do it because of his ultra wide turns. Like, I'm trying to just turn and attack to this pillar, but my turn was so wide I circled around it like 20 times before actually closing in on it. It's kinda goofy. Another issue I had was with the quick side loop. Each character has a neat little quick side loop ability, and there's entire puzzles that revolve around this one move. They're pretty straightforward, but if you run out of charge meter midway through, getting this meter back can be really annoying. Usually the game is pretty good about giving you a ton of ring bundles right before, but I still found myself running out midway through the puzzle and having to spam side loop for extra rings. And sometimes this was in really cramped areas where doing a side loop was kind of sketchy. Also, a huge nitpick is that you can only recharge this meter when it's empty. So anytime your meter is even semi-charged, none of the rings the game gives you to charge it actually do anything. I think this is what ends up leading to this gripe I have with these puzzles most of the time. It's a minor inconvenience, but it happened enough to where I got kind of fed up with it and dreaded puzzles that revolved around this ability. But continuing on, in between switching characters, you'll have to take control of Sonic a couple of times to take on the new cyberspace stages and climb up the five trial towers. Sonic controls like his usual self, but if you're like me and never unlock the spin dash in update 2, they straight up just give it to you here. Awesome, free stuff. In order to climb each trial tower, you'll need a certain amount of lookout cocoa, which can be obtained by either side looping these spots on the ground or by completing cyberspace objectives. So hey, let's talk about the new cyberspace levels. These cyberspace levels are probably the toughest yet. It is such a difficulty spike. But personally, I loved the challenge. There are so many alternate paths in each of these levels. I sometimes felt like there might have been even too many alternate paths. I'm pretty sure almost every cyberspace level in DLC 3 ends up bigger than the largest cyberspace level in Base Frontiers if you count all of the alternate paths. And trying these alternate routes for better times was awesome because there's just so many combinations. Optimizing my route for the fastest time was super rewarding because especially with the added spin dash, speedrunning these levels was insanely fun and satisfying. The spin dash really changes the game, not just in the overworld, but maybe even especially the cyberspace levels. Like look at the height you can get by spin dashing off of these inclines, it's crazy, and it allows you to be super experimental with the routes you take because of how much you can potentially skip over with it. Each level roughly shares the same objectives, most never before seen like finishing the level after collecting all of the number rings. These are a type of objective ring, first appearing in Sonic Lost World that requires you to collect them in order, starting with 5 and ending in 1. But it isn't as easy as it sounds. Some of these are placed in really tricky spots, so it can definitely be challenging to get everything in order or just get them at all. There's also the Silver Moon Ring objective, first appearing in Sonic Forces, which requires you to finish the level after collecting all 5 Silver Moon Rings. These are a bit different than the Red Rings found in the base game, as these rings are usually gathered in close proximity and require you to collect them in one consecutive go. Luckily, the order doesn't exactly matter, 
so that's nice, but grabbing them at all can be challenging. There's also the animal rescue objective, where you need to find all three animals and safely bring them to the drop zone. These ones are usually pretty easy, but there's some really tricky ones that cause you to drop them, like anytime Sonic slides. There are a few unique objectives too, like winning a race against a hologram tails, or completing a level before a bomb explodes. I have yet to do every single objective and S rank every cyberspace level, but I'm looking forward to continuing playing them because they're so addictive. After you get enough lookout cocoa, you're able to take on the trial towers, which are super similar to the marathon run towers from Rhea Island, but bumped up to the extreme. <laughs> The platforming is very challenging and really requires you to think and react fast. And these towers are so tall, falling off can be extremely punishing. Think getting over it, Sonic Edition. I've seen so many people online struggle with these towers, and my biggest tip is to hold down the parry when you fall. That way you can take time to assess the situation and better aim yourself to land somewhere rather than falling all the way down to the ground. This has saved my ass so many times and I'm honestly not seeing a lot of people use this trick. Also you can dodge to the left and right to give you a bit of extra distance. If you can, I suggest saving your double jump and boost to get back onto something at the last second. With these tips in mind, when you reach the top, you'll be able to take on one of the five trials, which usually involve combat in some shape or form. By far the most annoying of the regular trials was this one with the shell enemies. The way I did it was to side loop, get two hits and a stomp in, and rinse and repeat. But I also know you're able to constantly parry the shell on its way back and then get in some hits. I'm pretty sure that way is actually faster, but I found out about it after I'd already completed the challenge. The other trials aren't too bad, honestly. There's one where you have to parry these wolf enemies that surround you, it's probably the easiest one. This one that's a fight against a horde of enemies with a time limit, which I admittedly got a little bit too close to. And then this one where you fight a powered up ninja. But none of them will prepare you for the fifth and final trial. The Master King Coco Trial. In this trial, you have to consecutively fight all three titans using the same pool of just 400 rings. And you aren't able to replenish them by psi looping, so you're basically constantly counting down until you either run out or win. Oh yeah, you're also level 1 the entire time. Pretty stressful already, but what's more is that your parry has been nerfed, making it so that you aren't able to hold it down, but now have to time it within a much more precise window. This is the perfect parry, and it is probably the hardest aspect of Update 3. Depending on what difficulty you're on, the active window for the parry is different. Longer for easy mode, and only a handful of frames for hard mode. I had been playing on hard mode, and these bosses kicked my ass. At first, it seemed impossible. I mean, a lot of these attacks aren't exactly telegraphed all that well. You can definitely tell that this game wasn't exactly designed with the perfect parry in mind. I was constantly getting hit and wasting a ton of time. I'd managed to get into the second titan boss fight, Wyvern, with about half of my rings. And I still needed to defeat him and another boss if I was going to do this. My main struggle was definitely against Wyvern, as to even hit him you need to parry one of his missiles and then two of his slash attacks consecutively. Getting hit by any of these restarts the sequence, sending you to the beginning. This takes a lot of time to do, as you have to go through this entire sequence of Wyvern wasting a bunch of time flying before he even attacks you. The missiles were honestly no problem for me to parry, but the timing for parrying his slash attacks specifically were really hard for me to get down because of the way they're telegraphed. They hang on the wind-up animation for way longer than you'd expect before the attack actually comes out. And when you go into his second phase, the timing switches up, throwing off your muscle memory. But my least favorite attack has to be this weird shove he does with his tail, because it's so hard to read what's actually happening if you haven't studied the animation several times. It's a really awkward timing. There were so many times where I was tempted to switch to easy mode, which is something you probably should do if you're having this much trouble like I was. But I kept going. Slowly, I learned the timings to parry each boss's attacks. I optimized my strategies and combos in order to speedrun each phase of the boss as quickly as possible, eventually defeating Giganto barely using 60 rings. And after about an hour and a half of grinding these boss battles out, I broke through it all. I absolutely obliterated Giganto as usual, and had an amazing run against Wyvern and actually defeated him for the first time. Now I would go up against Knight for the first time with more than half of my rings left. I was super nervous because I hadn't fought against this boss since playing through the game last, which was probably almost half a 
year ago. And on top of that, I had to utilize the perfect parry. I was pretty worried because I didn't know this boss's patterns like I did the previous two. But I was riding the high from defeating Wyvern, and I felt invincible. At that point, I knew what strategies and combos worked best. So I proceeded to obliterate over half of Knight's health bar just like that. But now, phase two came and it was time for all of my perfect parry practice to help me clutch it out. It took a few tries to get my bearings with perfect parrying the shield, but after several attempts, I finally found myself an opening. And just like that, I defeated Knight, after putting all of my skills to the test, and it felt absolutely amazing. Something about repeating these boss fights and just absorbing them made me really appreciate them more. In the base game, even on hard mode, these fights can be easily won by spamming random attacks and holding down the parry if you think you're gonna be attacked. I never really knew what was going on, just that it looked cool. But now, I understand these bosses inside and out. I know every single one of their phases, all of their attacks, the timing for each parry, and even what they had for breakfast that morning. I became Ultra Instinct Chomix, and it felt good. But you see, this exact difficulty that Update 3 brings to the table has been very divisive among Sonic fans. Probably only 20 seconds in and you'll already feel the difficulty spike. You'll immediately notice that platforming is much less automated than in the base game. Much less dash pads, springs, grind rails. It's like taking the training wheels off your bike. And a lot of platforming sections can have puzzle-like elements. They aren't linear obstacle courses like before. You have to sometimes stop and figure out what the game is trying to get you to do. Some objectives are more clear than others, and some can be a little bit obtuse. But overall, there's an extra oomph to these sections. And depending on the person, this difficulty spike just might not be for you. I've seen plenty of people online disappointed with this update because of this difficulty spike. And you know what? That's totally fair. I think this update was very targeted towards more hardcore players. And if you're someone who just casually enjoys video games, and especially the video game side of Sonic, which is a lot of people, getting through this update might not be a possibility. It really is that hard, even on the easiest difficulty. But personally, this is exactly what I was looking for in a Sonic game. Something to kick my ass into getting truly good at this game, because that's when I feel most invested in it. It's when I'm forced to learn all of its mechanics inside and out by the game beating out all of my bad habits. Like, I thought I was decent at Sonic Frontiers before, but was quickly humbled when booting up Update 3. But after all of the blood, sweat, and tears that it took, I think I can now say I know the inner workings of how Sonic Frontiers works much better and have a newfound appreciation for its design. With anything Sonic related, it's impossible to please everyone. Sonic is just such a wide topic with so many different facets that it's not possible to please every single person. We all like different things. So for this one time, I'm gonna be selfish and just enjoy a piece of content that was finally targeted specifically for me, the more hardcore gaming-oriented side of the Sonic fanbase. And if that's also you, you may finally be able to make it to the final boss. So with Sonic completing his Ultra Instinct training, his friends bringing two emeralds each, and Eggman coming in clutch with the seventh emerald, it's time to fight the new and hopefully improved final boss. We start off fighting Supreme as usual, and after such a taxing fight against the Master King Coco Trial Titans, this fight is hilariously easy. It's like swatting a fly with a sledgehammer, especially if you're max level like I was. The difference in damage from level 1 and 99 is very obviously, I absolutely deleted this guy's health in mere seconds. You get to phase 2, do a bit of the same thing, and finish Supreme off with the usual QTE and a quick combo for the final bit of his health. This is where things get a bit different though. Instead of the end possessing Supreme and taking it to space for the final battle, the end links into Supreme with this umbilical cable right then and there, transforming it into some weird abomination with five arms. While severely less mobile, it's made up for with the amount of extra arms chucking energy blasts at you, all of which Supersonic is unable to dodge or parry. Well, at least in his current state. Because after getting hit enough times, a cutscene will trigger showing Sonic being consumed by the cyber corruption. But instead of letting it take him over, he harnesses its power to unlock an all new form with glowing blue eyes and surging electricity. A new form that we got to briefly see in the trailer for the final horizon. A lot of people, myself included, have been quick to make parallels to Super Saiyan 2 with the electricity and all, thus dubbing this form Super Sonic 2. We really Dragon Ball Z out here now. Which is cool and all, but I'm a bit more part to Blooper Sonic myself. Super Sonic 2 does some of the coolest looking shit of all time. First, you're finally able to parry those energy blasts back at Supreme unlike regular Super Sonic. However, it needs to be a perfect parry, just like in the Master King Coco trials for it to work. When you parry a complete series of these things, he has this awesome animation of effortlessly slapping the energy blasts away. It looks so cool. If you manage to do a few side loops, you'll be met with one of the most brutal attacks of all time. Sonic snaps his fingers and uses the Super Sonic hydraulic press to violently crush the 
this poor guy like a potato. Like, they were really teetering on the border of an E10 and M rating with this one, with all the weird pinkish red blood-like fluid spewing out of this guy's joints as you crush him. You can even, like, hear his bones snapping, it's freaking brutal. There's some other super cool cinematic moves throughout the fight, but nothing truly does damage to this guy as long as that Game Boy Advance link cable is on top of Supreme's head. I really struggled with this part in particular. Like, I knew the game wanted me to somehow disconnect the cable from his head, and I really thought I tried just about everything. I tried pretty much every attack. I tried psi-looping. I tried going over towards and attacking other parts of his body. I even tried brute forcing Sonic on top of his head to attack it, but I just could not figure out how to disconnect the cable. Sonic would not target it, no matter what I did. I really, really didn't want to look up how to do it online, so I attempted this for over 30 minutes to no avail. I eventually caved in and found out that the way to switch targets to focus on the cable was to press the dodge button to change targets. The dodge button. Two hours of grinding the Master King Coco trial with perfect parries on hard mode? Loved every second of it. 30 minutes trying to figure out how to destroy the cable on Supreme's head only to learn you have to just somehow know to press the dodge button to change targets? Nah. You. I'm not gonna lie, this really pissed me off with how unintuitive it was. I literally knew the game wanted me to attack the cable. I just didn't know how to change the targets, because to do this throughout the rest of the entire game, all you do is just walk into proximity and the target auto-changes. So when I tried that in the final fight and the target didn't change, I figured I had to do something else, like maybe Psyloop combo his head or something. So I tried pretty much everything else, hoping that some magic sequence of attacks would maybe do the trick. I've seen a lot of people defend this by equating this to the reversal you can pull on Ninja, which teaches you that you can go behind something by pressing the dodge button in combat. But I'd argue that that is completely different than what's going on here. One is pulling a reversal on an enemy when it's blocking. It makes sense and is very intuitive considering that dodging and doing a reversal are kind of in the same ballpark. It's also very obviously telegraphed that your attacks are completely useless as they clink off of its shield. But the cable on Supreme is a separate target. I'm not trying to do some fancy swoopy reversal move, I'm just trying to change the target. It's so unintuitive and isn't telegraphed at all since you can wail on his face all you want, making it seem like you're actually maybe doing something. So after you google how to actually disconnect the cable on top of Supreme's head, you can finally do damage. You'll eventually get to a point where you get it down to its last bit of health but can't finish it off. A lot of people also struggled on this part, but I got completely lucky I guess and accidentally figured out what to do here. You're supposed to go up to his back while he's down and side loop this strange looking hole. It isn't extremely obvious and there isn't a lot helping you into figuring this out, but the way I accidentally did this was because I incorporated a quick side loop into my combo out of pure habit from the 30 minutes I spent trying to figure out how to sever the cable on his head. This whips out Supreme's super cool sniper rifle that he used against you in the previous battle. Battle. Side loop it again, and you'll flip it up for Eggman to catch. Supreme then fires a barrage of projectiles, which Sage creates a freaking AT field straight out of Evangelion to block. The shield begins to crack, but Amy, Knuckles, and Tails fly in to support. Now we go in for round two. This time after depleting Supreme's health, Sonic literally punches him all the way up into space to align him right in front of the end. He then pulls a complete Sonic X and loads himself into Supreme's sniper rifle, Sonic Driver style. During the process of powering up for this final blast, the cyber corruption, now in his control, engulfs his entire body. He's then shot out, and for a split second, we see an entirely new form. The fabled Cyber Sonic. He grabs Supreme and pile drives him into the end, coming out of the opposite side, causing the end to implode and finally putting a stop to its world-ending wrath. Sonic drifts back down to Earth, reuniting with his friends, and things wrap up like they did in the original ending. Well, aside from one detail, Sage never sacrificed herself in this fight. I mean, she never has to, so we get to see a little scene of her and Eggman watching the star fall. You might also notice that Sage is completely white and blue here, signifying that she's had a complete change of heart. I don't think this will mean that she won't go head to head against Sonic and company in the future though. She's still obviously very devoted to Eggman as she calls him father before grabbing his hand to go home. And bam. Roll credits. Okay, so wow, that was a lot to take in, and I have a lot of thoughts about this whole ending sequence story-wise. Overall, huge improvement from the original ending. We got not one, but two entirely new forms, even if they only appeared for a very brief time. The fight, although extremely unintuitive at certain parts, was a better representation of a finale for a Sonic game than the previous bullet hell battle against the end. Sage and Sonic's friends are involved, even if only for a few seconds. And Eggman not only assists Sonic, but does so in probably the coolest way yet, launching him through the sniper rifle in probably one of the most badass scenes in the entire game. I loved a lot about this new ending, but there were quite a few things I thought were kinda strange. 
For instance, and this might be a pretty hot take, Supersonic 2 was a bit redundant in my opinion. He's pretty much just Supersonic with blue eyes instead of red. He doesn't really have any added ability that normal Supersonic doesn't have. And if you really think about it, in terms of raw gameplay and controls, he's literally just a nerfed version of Supersonic. Supersonic 2's parry isn't as overpowered since you have to have perfect timing and can't just hold it down. It's really funny too, because Sonic Team was so against including Hypersonic into a video game for such a long time because they didn't want to introduce power creep into the series. Which in this case is basically when Sonic gets so many new and powerful forms that they begin to make others obsolete. What I think they should have done was just make Cyber Sonic the one new form and just have you play as him during the final fight. Instead of being a direct upgrade from Super Sonic, it'd be more like a side grade, kind of like how Dark Spine Sonic from Secret Rings is. This would have done a better job to prevent that very power creep that Sega was talking about, because it is a real thing that you gotta be careful of as a writer. I also really wanted to see more of this form anyways, he has such a cool design and I think it's just better than Super Supersonic 2s. It's kind of strange for Sega to make such a big deal about adding new forms and then making one that only appears for two seconds. I also do miss some of the elements from the original ending, like how Sonic eventually went up into space to fight the end. Now I'm not saying to bring back the shoot 'em up gameplay, but having the new fight take place in space would have been really cool. You also don't get to hear the end's creepy monologue in the new ending, something I really enjoyed in the original fight. Because we already barely know what this thing even is, so without this monologue you have even less context. Another thing I found weird was how they rearranged arranged I'm Here using Kellen Quinn. It's a good-ass song, don't get me wrong, and I'm so glad they brought Kellen back. But I can't help but feel like they overshadowed the original singer with a celebrity singer by remaking it with Kellen. I think it would have been way cooler if they just had him do a completely new song for the final boss. It's weird having the first fight against Supreme have the original version of I'm Here, and then having both an orchestrated version of I'm Here, and then a slightly different version of I'm Here but with Kellen Quinn. At that point, just make a new song, it's crazy redundant. But despite these flaws, this was pretty much the ending I always envisioned in my head. After all, I made a bunch of theory videos before this game's release, and they were super on track to become true for most of the game. I predicted the voice guiding Sonic to be evil. What if this disembodied voice, much like the one from Shadow of the Colossus, is maliciously using our desire to save our friends as a way to get us to remove these titans? For Sonic to slowly become corrupted the more he saved his friends, having to choose between saving himself or his companions. And I'm thinking that Sonic will be faced with a moral dilemma of having to choose to either one, save his friends while inadvertently corrupting the environment and himself, or two, leave his friends behind and prevent further damage. But by the end of the game, it took such an unexpected, anticlimactic turn that they were all shot down. Originally, I was certain that the cyber corruption would lead to some kind of new cyber form. Super Sonic won't be the full potential that Sonic reaches in Sonic Frontiers. No, there's something else. Something that the game has actually been teasing us with for a while now. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Cyber Sonic Theory. And I was so disappointed it didn't happen in the base game. I didn't just make those theories because it's what I thought was going to happen. It was also what I wanted to happen. So now that it's been made real, I can finally rest easy knowing that there is finally some form of satisfaction to this game's ending. That all of the buildup actually leads to something worthwhile. Sonic Frontiers The Final Horizon was way more than I ever expected. While some may find its messy and noisy level design and insane difficulty spike as a negative, for me it was a direct nod towards the hardcore fans that have patiently been waiting for something to test our limits. And while it may not be extremely graceful, it was very impactful. In its current state, Sonic Frontiers is this weird messy game with a lot of heart. Its additional content feels strung together to make this charming Frankenstein game with super cool but disjointed features. Sonic Frontiers truly was the beta test to an amazing Sonic game. And watching this game evolve before our very eyes has been a stressful but rewarding journey and I'm excited to see what happens next for the Blue Rat. All I can say is Sonic Team is definitely on the right path to something amazing. Anyways, that's gonna be it for today's video. If you liked it, make sure to leave a fat like and subscribe for more way past cool Sonic content such as this. In the comments below, let me know what you thought of The Final Horizon. Thank you so much to my amazing channel members. And with all that being said, I hope everyone has a fantastic day. Peace.